It's no secret that I love Kirby music. I've been meaning to talk about some Kirby tunes for a while, but never really found a good place in any other video to put a Kirby tune. So Kirby's getting its own video. Plus I'm trying to milk the YouTube algorithm with a six levels of X type video. So let's hop right in. Before we start, let's briefly talk about our first concept, tonality. Tonality in essence is the concept of certainty in a key center due to support from the harmony and melody. I could talk about the theory jargon for hours, but let's take a quick peek at our level one example, Green and Greens, fittingly the first level from Kirby's Dreamland and Kirby Superstar. harmony and melodic line both support the stable sound of C major. At the beginning of the form, the melody jumps from the fifth scale degree, G, to the tonic, C, supported by the tonic chord, C major, firmly establishing our key as C major with absolutely no ambiguity. The following chords in the phrase continue to support this, and with no accidentals or non-diatonic chords for this first part, it only further cements our key of C major. This tune, at least so far, is a perfect example of something very tonal. The only room for ambiguity is right here, on the repeat of our melody. We have the secondary dominant chord, E7, which sets up our A minor resolution, but quickly gives us a 4-5-1 immediately after to tell us we're still firmly in C major. And this A minor chord was only a secondary dominance resolution, rather than a key center. On the topic of this resolution though, it's one of my favorite things in music, reharmonizing a familiar melody within a piece. Notice how the melody here is exactly the same as the previous phrase, but whereas the first time around it was expected and diatonic, this time adds a little bit of spice with the E7 and resolves differently than before. It just pulls at the heartstrings, such a simple yet fun thing that doesn't appear too often. This concept will actually come up in the next video, releasing later this month hopefully. But anyways, let's get back to talking about tonality. By the end of the video, we'll listen to a tune that would be closer to something atonal or lacking a solid key center. But for now, let's continue talking about happy green greens in our second concept, modulation. Modulation, or simply changing keys, is one way we shift our tonality. But not all modulations were created equal. Where we specifically modulate to determines how much the tonality shifts. It mostly depends on how closely related the two keys are on the circle of fifths. The most basic example of modulation that shifts the tonality the least would be a modulation one degree away, like from C major to G major. This is because the only difference between C major and G major is the F in C and the F sharp in G. Keep in mind, half step modulations like C to D flat, despite being only one degree away chromatically, are generally some of the most jarring modulations possible. If you look at the circle of fifths, you'll notice they're on almost opposite sides and as such, only share two common tones. If you watched my Owl House video, you see my relative axis theory, which demonstrates the connection between four key centers, separated by minor third, through the relationship between relative minor and parallel major. Without retreading everything I talked about in that video, the takeaway is that despite not being too closely related on the circle of fifths, modulation up by minor third is very common and works very well, because it's essentially modulation to parallel minor. For instance, Modulating from C major to E flat major is essentially modulating from C major to C minor, because E flat major and C minor share all of the same notes. So keeping in mind the modulation interval of minor third, let's listen to the next part of Green Greens. takes us squarely into E flat major after ending the previous phrase on C major, our previous tonic. There's no overlap or setup for this modulation. It's just cleanly in C major. Then, at the beginning of the next phrase, we're in E flat. This is what's called a direct modulation. It's the most straightforward kind of modulation because most of the time, there's no ambiguity in key center. We're just in one key, and then at the beginning of the next section, we're in a different key. Everything in this section is entirely diatonic to E flat, both the chords and melody. At the end of the section, however, we have the non-diatonic G major. This chord, in context, serves as a secondary dominant to the 6 minor or relative minor of E flat, C minor. However, 
What actually happens is a resolution to C major, cleanly looping us back to the beginning in C. That G major chord has an apparent function in E flat major moving forward, but also has apparent function looking backwards from C major. Because of the dual nature of this chord used in the modulation, this is what we call a pivot modulation, simply because we're pivoting between the two keys rather than just jumping straight into it with no setup. The takeaway for Green Greens and our first level of key changes is the difference between direct and pivot modulations and the role they play in bending tonality. Notice the role of the relative axis in this tune's pivot modulation and the interplay between C major and C minor, E flat major's relative minor. It'll come up again in the next two examples. Speaking of which, we can move on to our level 2 modulation example with Grape Garden, the version from Nightmare in Dreamland. I've had a particular fondness for this song ever since I played this game on GBA a decade and a half ago, and I'm 100% convinced it's because of how it so gracefully bends the tonality. Let's take a listen. despite seemingly diatonic upon listening, does a few subtle things to make us slightly unsure of the tonality. The intro starts off on the 4, G flat major, rather than the 1, D flat, which isn't necessarily uncommon, but you'll notice it never resolves down to the 1 during the entirety of the intro, only ever hitting us with chords that outline the scale of D flat, therefore implying our tonality. This would normally be enough to plant us in D flat, but take a look at the second chord, the F minor. The bass consistently hits the natural 9, G, on this 3 chord, despite the diatonic note being flat 9, G flat. This was probably done for two reasons. A minor chord with a flat 9 most of the time sounds fairly dissonant and whack, while a minor chord with a natural 9 sounds pretty nice. Another reason Hirokazu Ando could have chosen to add the natural 9 is because it borrows from the Lydian mode brightening up the sequence of chords to make it feel like bouncing around on clouds, just as Kirby does at this point in the game. Regardless, a consequence of this non-diatonicism is destabilizing the already relatively unstable tonality in the intro. Since we never hit the tonic, D flat, we're relying on the other chords to paint the tonality, but its stability is entirely dependent on how thoroughly they can convince us we're in D flat. If we add something like that F minor 9, it adds a layer of uncertainty that's already compounded upon the layer of uncertainty we're in. I think of it like, imagine you're moving around your house with your eyes closed. You can probably find your way around, but it's entirely dependent on how much the markers around you tell you about your surroundings, like feeling for a chair or a wall you expect to be there. If the furniture is moved around, you get confused. But anyways, that's enough about furniture, let's move on to the rest of the tune. the wacky tonality bending in the 16 measures is accomplished with two techniques we've talked about in Green Greens, pivot modulation and modulation by relative axis. Let's break down these first four chords. After the intro, we hit the downbeat on a solid D flat, firmly solidifying our tonality as D flat major. But then something interesting happens. The next chords are the non-diatonic B major, A major, and E major. Let's analyze this in D flat major. B major, A major, and E major would be flat 7, flat 6, and flat 3 respectively, all borrowed from parallel minor, D flat minor. But that last chord, E major, doesn't sound like some modal interchange funny chord. It instead sounds like a new tonic. Let's analyze this section retrospectively in E major. D flat would be a previous tonic, and B, A, and E are all diatonic to E, as the 5, 4, and 1 respectively. Over the course of these four chords, we bend the tonality from D flat major to E major, jumping counterclockwise on the relative axis using the two middle chords as pivot chords. What we hear moving forward in D flat major as modal interchange from D flat minor, we hear retrospectively as a diatonic 5 4 1 in E major, a classic plagal cadence sound. We shouldn't be quick to dismiss the analysis in D flat major as unrelated modal interchange though. Because there is such a precedent for 5 chords to deceptively resolve to 6, the relative minor, it's an almost expected sound at this point. The same resolution of a whole step became commonly used to resolve from flat 7 to 1 in major, often preceded by the flat 6. 
The flat 6, flat 7, 1 resolution is, in essence, just borrowing the 4 and 5 from parallel minor's relative major, creating a more wistful, triumphant flavor than if we just used the 4 and 5 of our respective 1. Let's listen to each. The interplay between relative axis tonal centers allows a flat 7 to sound like a 5, and vice versa. Listen to the same section again, but with the 4 bars after. The first B major moving forward from D flat sounds like a flat 7, which recontextualizes itself as a 5 upon hitting E major. But the second time we hit B major, we hit it in E major, which is helped by the F sharp in B major sounding like a 2-5 that sets up a resolution to E. But what actually happens is a deceptive resolution back up to D flat, which recontextualizes it as sounding like a flat 7. Because our change in key centers to E major was so brief and unstable, it's considered to be what's called a tonicization rather than a modulation. Basically, if modulation is jumping into the deep end of a new key center, tonicization is dipping your feet in the water and then leading after a bit. The idea of tonicization will come up in the next tune. Something I find super interesting is the structure of these seven bars before the A flat. Assuming F sharp minor and A are interchangeable subdominant functioning chords that set up B major, these seven bars are a palindromic, meaning it's the same thing read forwards and backwards. D flat major sandwiches the two pivot chords with an E major tonicization perfectly in the center. Super cool. But anyways, the takeaway for level 2 is the role of tonicization, not resolving to the one chord, and pivoting between two relative axis key centers to bend tonality. Let's now move on to level 3. Our level 3 tune is City Trial from the GameCube classic Kirby Air Ride. The part we'll be listening to is right at the end, right before the loop, but before we take a look at that, let's just listen to the beginning to get a feel for the feel. solid A minor tonality. At measure 15, rather than resolving back to our tonic of A minor, the E7 deceptively resolves, modulating to C minor. Notice how this first part of the melody is exactly the same as the first part of the melody at the beginning of the tune. This is one way to immediately stabilize the tonality after a key change, because the sound of the familiar melody helps to mitigate any jarring change in accidentals. We stay in C minor for the rest of the tune up until the end, and while a lot of cool things happen I'd like to talk about, Let's just take a look at the ending, where we can talk about modulation. Let's listen. Notice our F minor 7, B flat 7, which resolves to C minor. Throughout this tune, they've been using the classic flat 7, 1 minor resolution to condition us to hear 2-5 or 4-5 as wanting to resolve up to minor, rather than down a fifth to the relative major. This conditioning comes to fruition in the next phrase, but first let's talk about those last two chords. Both of these chords, while ultimately functioning as a 2 minor 7 and sub 5 of C respectively, are non-diatonic, destabilizing our key center and setting us up for the next part. Let's see what happens now. flat resolves deceptively to a B major, C sharp major vamp. This kind of sound makes us think we're now in E flat minor, with the B and C sharp acting as the flat 6 and flat 7 respectively. It gives us two measures of this to let us get used to the sound of E flat minor, and to get us to expect a resolution to E flat, but then the next measure gives us D major and E major. Since these chords are so jarringly non-diatonic to E flat minor, 
and because it follows the same movement as the previous two measures, we feel it as a modulation to F sharp minor, with the D and E major serving the same function in F sharp as the B and C sharp in E flat minor. But rather than resolving there, we go up one more time to F and G, which finally gives us an expected resolution to A minor, which plays the motif from the beginning of the tune to firmly establish our key center as A minor. Similar to the beginning, notice how in the past eight measures, we hit the same scale degree every time we change key centers. B flat is the major seventh of B, C sharp is the major seventh of D, and E is the major seventh of F. It's just using the same technique from the beginning to ground us in tonicized key centers, despite the fast moving, seemingly unrelated major chords. The coolest thing about this modulation from C minor to A minor though, is how it was actually accomplished. If we look at our relative axis, C minor and A minor are only one degree away, so realistically, the shortest path to take would just be a jump clockwise one degree. But instead, we take the long way around, jumping counterclockwise by three degrees until we land at A minor. Let's listen again, but with the key centers highlighted on the relative axis. Specifically because we're modulating like this, the harmony is only moving up and in small increments, building excitement and supporting the eventual triumphant resolution with literal upwards movement. While I can't say for certain that's why the composers chose to modulate like this, it makes a lot of sense, and it's just cool either way. The takeaway for level 3 is the role of tonicization in a longer modulation, and using the same melody over different key centers to stabilize. Before we move to level 4, let's look at the last few bars in A minor. When we do finally resolve to A, we get a repeating A minor D major sound, implying the Dorian mode. If you don't know what modes are, I'll save it for a future video, but the short explanation is, scales derive from the major scale with a more ambiguous tonality than straight up major or minor. The important thing though is that modality adds ambiguity to our key center, which is a perfect segue into our level 4 tune, Rainbow Resort from Kirby's Adventure. Let's listen to the first bit. to this tune is just a simple D flat major 7, E flat 7 over D flat vamp. This could be analyzed as a 4 and 5 in the key of A flat, but since it never resolves, and especially because we have a pedal point D flat in the bass, we instead think we're in the D flat Lydian mode. This ends up directly modulating to D Lydian, which continues the same chord progression of 1 major 2 7 we heard earlier. Pretty straightforward so far. Let's see what happens next. end of that first section, we have a 2-5 which takes us to B minor, E major vamp. Because of the pedal point B in the bass, and because we're used to hearing a modal sound in this piece, and because there's already a precedent for modulation, it sounds like we modulated to the B Dorian mode. But the chord after this is an inversion of A major. To me, this sounds like the most solid resolution in the entire tune, which would recontextualize the prior four chords as a tonicization of B moving forward, with retrospective analysis hearing it as a diatonic 2-5 of A. Not only that, but it recontextualizes the entire first section as a 4-5 vamp that wants to resolve to A major. The thing is though, that's how I hear it, and I could be completely incorrect. I've sent this tune to a few of my friends to analyze, and all of us disagree with each other. As much as I hate distasteful subjectivity, I would have to argue this tune's key centers are entirely subjective. That's the power of modality. The thing about modes is that the modal sound is more unstable than normal major or minor. Major can mess around with tonicizations or diatonicism, but because the modal sound is so fragile, if anything sounds slightly outside of the mode, the illusion breaks. Hirokazu Ando uses this to his advantage. He sets up a resolution to A major, which isn't even in root position, but that's just enough to make the listener question the established tonality. 
But since it's not firmly establishing A major as a tonality, it's only a question and not an answer. The next phrase modulates using the method we saw in City Trial. We have the exact same melody as the previous phrase with the exact same chords, just moved up a half step. Even though we're modulating to a far away, almost entirely unrelated key, the jarringness is mitigated through hearing a familiar melody and harmony, just in a different key. Overall, this tune is a beautiful modal mess that somehow works really well. The takeaway for level 4 is the role of modality in distorting the listener's sense of key center and modulating by half step through familiar melody and harmony. Level 5 is where it begins to get hard to even find a key signature. You'll notice in the sheet music, I didn't even bother with the key signature because of the constantly shifting tonality. Let's listen to The Cave in the Sky from one of the more recent games, Kirby Triple Deluxe. A lot is happening here. We start the groove in this funky, Brazilian bayo beat. The harmony has a classic, modal, Phrygian dominant sound, going between the 1 major and flat 2 major. After the short intro, the melody picks up in a frenetic, offbeat rhythm. The harmony stays the same as the intro for these first three chords, but the melody is something weird. What in the hell is this? It's not diatonic to D Phrygian dominant, the chord of E flat, not even just D major, instead sounding like D whole tone. The presence of the non-diatonic sharp 11, G sharp, and sharp 5, A sharp, completely rips us out of D Phrygian dominant, especially since it appears so soon in the melody. This is another method of destabilizing the center, polytonality, or two different tonalities at once. In our case, the harmony implies D Phrygian dominant, while the melody kind of implies D whole tone. Admittedly, polytonality can get way, way more whack, but this section still technically counts as polytonal. The next chord is also interesting. It's C sharp minor 7, which also isn't diatonic to D Phrygian dominant or D major. Technically, it could be derived from the relative axis, but I instead hear it as just a quote unquote non functional chord that serves only to perfectly voice lead down to the following C minor 7, which is the exact same chord but a half step lower. Let's listen to the next part. Following C minor 7 and F7 form a 2 5, which sets up a pretty convincing resolution to B flat major. Not giving us time to breathe, the B flat major turns into a B flat minor 7 E flat 7 2 5, which would imply a resolution to A flat major, but deceptively resolves to A flat minor 7 and D flat 7, serving a 2 5 us squarely to a new tonality of G flat major. Overall, the execution is relatively simple, but the theory is relatively complex. We've talked before about how the basis of all Western harmonic resolution in tonality is built on the 2-5 movement, and that's exactly almost entirely what happens here. I've highlighted each 2-5 relationship, and you can see how much of this section consists of these. Where we hear resolution is simply where the mostly unrelated 2-5s choose to resolve. Since the C minor 7, F7, 2-5 is unrelated to the previous key center of D major, we hear these chords as a fresh 2-5 to a new key center, and when it resolves expectedly to B flat, we hear that as a modulation, or at least tonicization, of B flat major. Then, the following B flat minor 7 and E flat 7, unrelated to B flat major, would imply a resolution down a fifth to A flat major, but instead serves set up an A flat minor 7, which 2-5s to our real resolution G flat major. Because the way it was framed, this 2-5 doesn't imply new tonality in retrospective analysis. If you have a keen eye for this kind of thing, or really liked my Coltrane Changes video, you already realized what these three key centers form. It's a three-tonic system, John Coltrane's holy triangle of key centers separated by major third. I would really recommend watching that video if you want me to explain it in further detail, but in short, this modulation interval, especially twice, is very uncommon. After our modulation to G flat, we have another non-diatonic 2-5 which takes us to a new tonality of E-flat major. This next section, until the last measure, is exactly the same as our previous section but up a half step. Similar to City Trial, we have a familiar melody and harmony after modulation to mitigate the jarringness of modulation, and, similar to Rainbow Resort, we can use this to specifically mitigate the jarringness of modulating by half step, especially when it's not just modulation to a single tonality, but modulation to a three-tonic system, this kind of technique is crucial to not destroy the entire sense of tonality completely. Let's listen to this section and see what comes next.
After our E flat G B3 tonic system section, we have a B section that consists of what I call cycle downs. In essence, it's just two five ones and then another two five one a whole step down. It works particularly well because each two is built on the same root as the preceding one. For instance, look at how the first two five on the second page connects to the second. We have B flat minor seven, E flat seven, A flat major seven. Then an A flat minor seven, D flat seven, G flat major seven. Because each major 7 is tonicized, it's a strong foundation for the next root of the following 2-5, which ultimately serves to take our key center down a whole step on the next tonicized major 7. Let's listen to the last part of the tune. The cycle down ends in G flat, and we get a solid 2-5 back to our 1 to solidify the key center. But after we hit the 1, we get a series of wacky pedal point hybrid chords. We don't really need to talk about these, but damn, they're pretty cool. A few more wacky jazz chords happen that take us back into the intro groove and Phrygian dominant feel. We have this F chord that isn't diatonic to Phrygian dominant or major, but serves to voice lead the marimba line nicely, modulating back to our starting key of D. After we modulate, we continue the intro groove and then have a cute little 2-5 to take us squarely back to the beginning of the form. Overall, the takeaway for level 5 is the role of polytonality, multitonic systems, and non sequitur 2 5 ones to destabilize the tonality. Let's now move on to our final tune and level 6, Marx's theme from Kirby Superstar Ultra. Yeah, this is impossible to analyze. GG, everyone. Okay, so jokes aside, this tune's all over the place. In terms of tonality, it's genuinely very difficult to place any specific key centers because we almost never get a set of two adjacent chords with a functional relationship. It mostly feels like non sequitur colors moving through randomly changing time signatures. There are what I think of as pockets of fleeting tonality. The intro starts us in A flat minor major 7, an uncommon and unstable minor chord to establish tonality in, but we do feel like we're in A flat minor at least. The following chord, the E flat 7, would normally further cement this tonality as it's the 5 of A flat, but it immediately takes us into F minor major 7. The following chords have little to no relationship to F and rip us out until we arrive at F minor again. The repetition of F minor and the accompanying melodic motif at the beginning of each phrase in the A section probably gives us the closest thing we have to a solid tonality, at least until the end. In the B section, the set of four chords after G minor all feel diatonic to B flat minor and almost serve to establish that B flat minor 7 as a weak tonal center, but then we get more unrelated constant structure major 7s that rip us out of that until we arrive at a mostly functional resolution to G major. In the next phrase, we modulate to E flat major and get entirely tonal, functional relationships, and even a 2 5 at the very end that deceptively resolves back to the beginning in A flat minor. I've been throwing around the term functional a lot, but I want to clarify that nothing in this tune is necessarily non functional. In my opinion, if the chord has a purpose, it has function. The chords throughout the tune, despite being mostly functionally unrelated to each other, often voice lead nicely or otherwise serve as a wacky color contrast in comparison to their adjacent chords. Also, because of the aforementioned pockets of tonality, I really hesitate to call this tune atonal either, but I'll save my manifesto about the restrictiveness of music theory terminology for a later video. The takeaway for level 6 is that tonality can be whatever you want. Just do whatever and have fun with funny chords and cool colors. 
Despite the video length, I haven't even scratched the surface of Crazy Kirby tunes, and I actually still have one more tune I want to talk about, but I'll save it for the next video after the next one, where it'll be more on topic. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to stop Kirby from inhaling my Berkeley degree before it's too late.